Montebello! Good morning! He has risen! All right, we got about half of you guys got that. We got to try that again. He has risen! All right, you guys ready to worship? Amen, amen. Real quick, we just want to welcome anybody joining us for the first time. If you could raise your hand, we want to give you a warm Montebello welcome. Awesome, welcome to the ark. Awesome, welcome, welcome, welcome. Hey, listen, there's some free hot chocolate over there with the coffee as well. Make sure you guys get some after service. They got the malas. The cafe is open. Go get some fellowship afterwards and uh, enjoy the service. Let's open up in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this morning, Lord. It's so beautiful to just see uh, the brisk, the, 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 the air, the quietness. It's just, it's just so wonderful to celebrate what you did for us by opening that tomb and just raising from the dead, Lord. We thank you for this time. We pray that your spirit would be invited in this place to just lift our hearts and just to bless your name, Lord. We love you so much, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, guys. Good morning, morning. Hello. Hi. Wait a minute. Good morning. Good All that 
king. Worthy is the king of all good and great. Worthy is the lamb who is slain. Worthy is the king of all good and great. Worthy is the lamb who is slain. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. Redeemed by His grace, 
and the house of the Lord sing
Good morning. Good morning. The Lord has risen. Oh, you gotta, you gotta learn. You gotta, this is something you have to learn, okay? In the old days, like the 1700s, when the British came to this country, Christmas was very important for them. And they, will, they brought that tradition. On Easter Sunday, they will say, the Lord has risen, and the response will be louder. It will, they, will, they will respond by saying, the Lord has risen indeed. Are you ready? Ready? Let me take a deep breath. I was running. The Lord has risen. The Lord has risen. The Lord has risen. Amen. Why don't you clap? Just to thank God. You're alive. You're alive. Take a deep breath right now. Take a deep breath. One, two, three. Ah, oh, thank you, Lord, for the breath in our lungs. We thank you for allowing us to gather here. This is not 2020. This is not 2021, Lord. This is a new day, a new year. Remind us of who you are this morning. Revitalize us. Wake us up. Remind us, Father, of your grace, of your goodness, of your intervention, your salvation. This plot that you have created for us. Be with us, Lord. Be with the person next to us. May you bless their private world as we pray for our own family, our own children, our own marriages. We pray for our neighborhoods. We pray for our jobs. We pray, Father, for our country. We pray for the president, Lord. We pray extremely a lot for the president. And ask that wisdom will come upon him or at least surround him with a bunch of people with divine wisdom. We pray for the peace around the world and the peace of Jerusalem and the peace of Israel. We ask you now to bind us together as a family, as a community, as we're gathered here together, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Turn around and say hi to somebody. And we're going to sing this one more little short song just to prepare us. Some of you were asleep. I was watching you. So let's just worship. Lord my God, when I am awesome wonder, consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. Then sings my soul, my Savior. God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, and when I that God is son not sparing, sent him to die. I scarce can take it in that on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come, with shout of acclamation, and take me home What joy shall fill my heart Then I shall bow In humble adoration And then proclaim My God, how great Thou art Then sings my soul My Savior God to Thee how great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how 
have a seat. Good morning again. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Would you open your Bibles to Luke chapter 23 verse 50. We need to revisit Good Friday. We need to be reminded of uh, that melancholic emotion of that Friday. Because everything is going to change the next morning which will be this morning. This is the morning they changed history for the rest of our human history. It was on this day over 2,000 years ago where world history was transformed. Humanity was never the same. Here we are, like millions around the world, we are commemorating and celebrating this powerful day. I want you to know, if you didn't know, that without the resurrection, we would have a miserable religion a religion that has no value no purpose no hope if there is no resurrection Paul the Apostle said it so clearly in 1st Corinthians 15 if there is no resurrection basically he says our religion sucks forgive me for being so rude but there are many people with a religion that has no meaning whatsoever but here we have the facts here, lest we be remiss, I want to read the gospel. The gospel of the resurrection, the good news, is recorded in all four gospels. But I also want to share with you my subject. A subject I entitled it, God's Orchestrated Plot. Now, plot sounds like a very mysterious conspiracy scheme, so I like to call it God's Orchestrated Plan. God had a plan from the beginning. God always has a plan. You have a plan. If you don't have a plan, you're going to plan to fail. All of us need to plan. In every stage of our life, we're planning. Or being planned for you when you were a child. But once you become 15 years old, you begin to strategize in your own life. At 15 years old, you begin to plan, oh, what's my next move? Who's my next boyfriend, my next girlfriend? You plan, you scheme, don't lie. Then you plan to buy a car or to rent a car or get a car from dad and mom. You plan and you plan your graduation. Then you plan to go to college, Lord willing. Then you plan to get married. Then you plan to have children. Then you plan to buy your home or you plan to get your business. But we must plan. Now I want you to know that God always has a plan. He has a plan for you. He has a plan for me. The day of the resurrection was not serendipity. It wasn't a coincidence. This was all designed, orchestrated, if I may, by the master himself. But lest I be remiss, first of all, I want to thank all the staff for everything they did every with The whole week, the staff has been very busy. And I thank God for the pastors and all the assistants, all the technical staff, everyone behind the scenes. People you do not see, but I make it happen for us. The people that made the coffee, the chocolate, uh, the people that are behind the scenes, I thank God for them. But a plot, lest we forget, oh, go with me to, I did share with you, right, Luke 23. We visit Friday, it says in verse 50 of Luke 23. Now behold, there was a man named Joseph. He was a council member, a good and just man. And he had not consented to their decision indeed. He was from Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who himself was also waiting for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen, and laid it in a tomb that it was hewn out of the rock where no one has ever lain before. That day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew near. And the women who had come with Jesus from Galilee follow after and they observed the tomb, how his body was laid. Then they returned home and prepared spices and fragrant oils. And they rested on the Sabbath 
according to the commandment and thus finish the day of the crucifixion as the body of Jesus is extracted from that tree a horrible situation and we are told that that Nicodemus the man that is featured in John chapter 3 the priest who asked Jesus how he may get into heaven and Jesus told Nicodemus you must be born again he who wants to enter into the kingdom of God he who wants to see the kingdom of God must be born again and Nicodemus said how can an old man go back into my mother's womb and Jesus said hey, I'm talking to a religious man I'm trying to tell you simple stuff but I can't tell you spiritual truth because you can't handle spiritual truth Nicodemus we don't hear of him again but at the end he's a hero he commits himself with Joseph to bear their their secrecy their secret agent for Jesus they are secret Christians and finally they came out of that closet on that Friday only to remove the body of Christ they had the authority permission and the ladies we are told the ladies of Galilee those that were following Jesus they never left they were shadowing this couple as they took the body and they they, they looked and they shadowed them and they followed them and they realized okay the body is there they went home and prepared what it was customary and the Jewish funeral to give him a proper washing, a appropriate, sanctified washing. And thus, Friday ends. We are told in verse 1 of chapter 24, now on the first day of the week, that will be Sunday, very early in the morning, they, the women, and certain other women with them, came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed. The word perplexed, they had their minds blown. And it happened as they were greatly minds blown about this. That behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and they bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee? When he said to you, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. And they remember his words. Then they returned from the tomb and they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene. Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. Verse 11, ladies, nothing's changed. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. All we know that the body is missing. They did not see it according to the Gospel of Luke. When you read the other accounts, there was an encounter. And Mary confronted, was confronted by Jesus. We know that. But we leave it here in Luke chapter 22. We'll come back to it. We'll circle back to it. Because you see, what I want to share with you is this divine plot. What is a plot? It's a well-orchestrated plot to plan and to organize. It's a complicated event or course of action. Like I shared with you, I don't like the word plot because it sounds like conspiracy or a scheme or subversion. I like the word design or orchestrator. The word design means a plan. Someone designed a plan, an arrangement, blueprint, a purpose or intention that exists to thought it to exist behind an action behind a fact, behind a plan. You remember when Jesus said in John chapter 10, no one takes my life away from me. Remember that? He says, I have the right to lay it down and I have the right to pick it up. No one takes my life away from me. Why am I emphasizing that? Because in the tradition of ignorance, when people don't know, only they know is tradition, they believed that Jesus was a victim of circumstances. They believed that Jesus was just a sheeply innocent man who got jacked up and railroaded. That's not true. Jesus came here with a purpose. God had a plan. 
The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 13, right after chapter 13, Jesus, we are told, when Jesus knew it was his time to go back to the Father, after he completed his ministry, you see, at the age of 30 years old, he began his ministry for three years. Jesus was on a clock. He was on a divine timetable. He had to go to the Passover. So it was not an accident. It was a master orchestrator. The Bible says to you and I in Romans 8, 28, check this out. All things work for good. Okay, this section knows what's happening. <laughs> All things work for all things work for for those who are called and are love and love God. God has a purpose for them. That's the orchestration of God. I want you to know if you miss out what was happening today. I don't want you to miss this. God has a plan for you. Maybe you're 10 years old. You may not understand that plan, but God has a plan for you. Or maybe you're over the hill like me. Maybe you're over 45. <laughs> That's right. You're over 45, you're over the hill. Stop. That's reality check. If you're over the hill, you're 60, 70 years old, God has a plan for you. People my age begin to plan their lives. To plan to retire. A, a plan to make sure your, your, med, your, your medicine pharmaceutical chain is on. Make sure you visit, make sure your cholesterol, and make sure you don't fall. Make sure you, it, we're at that age where we're planning. What is the opposite of not planning? We know that God plans. This is all His plan. But what happens with people who don't plan? You ever heard of the word aimless? There's a word that I, that I found out is called meandering or floating, purposeless. Like a complete unknown, like a rolling stone with, a, with no direction home. <laughs> a disorderly life, scattered life. Someone said helter-skelter. Or we call it roundabout. In Spanish, it's called la glorieta, the roundabout. You ever seen those roundabouts? You, you, you go in your car and you go around, you go around, you go around. You go, wow, we're moving. We're moving where? We're moving. That's called a roundabout. That's called helter-skelter. It means you're, we have no plan. All you're doing is existing. You have nothing. You just wait for the next day when people greet you. If they ask you, how are you doing? And you respond, well, you know, just hanging. Just hanging. What are you doing with your life? There's so many people that we were suspended in an automated suspension for two years. And for two years, while we were in animated suspension, there's many things that we did. There were many things that were done to us. We're still reeling head trips. We still have suicides, suicide attention. The use of drugs in this community has shot up like 250%. Crime has gone up in the last two years. Homelessness has gone up. I can tell you know what I'm saying. What is happening to our nation? I don't know what is happening to our nation, but I do know that God has a plan for us. Amen. For you personally. The opposite of not having one, as I share with you, is being aimless. Everyone has to have a plan. And when the plan doesn't work, we go to the contingency plan. Or we call it the backup plan. But you must have a plan. And I want you to know that we have a master plan planner here he's an orchestrator the orchestrator comes from the word orchestrator which means a composer a composer is an arranger of music the composer orchestrates the music for the symphony orchestra to provide with orchestration to arrange to combine us to achieve a desire of maximum effect orchestrated preparations see orchestrator he calls the shots He's just doing this. He pointed to music. He is the conductor. And I want you to know that after the resurrection, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit came upon the church. That's second, the book, second chapter of Acts. It was there that the timid Peter, you find timid, very Peter, very timid on the last throes of the gospel. 
We call him a ranker. He ranked out three times. And he wept sorely. And it wasn't until the day of the resurrection and the other account, one of the angels tell the ladies who came, the first evangelist, when they saw that Jesus was alive, he says, quickly, go tell his disciples that we'll meet him in Galilee. And behold, personally, go tell Peter. Wow. Go tell the disciples, but make sure you go and tell Gary. Go tell the disciples, make sure you tell Lupi, Sandra, Teodora, Chamorra, Chavala. Personal. Why? Because Peter needs to be reassured. And in John chapter 21, we see that reassurance. Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you. Do you love me? Yes, I love you. Peter, do you love me? Then feed my sheep, take care of my sheep. That was three times. Peter was still weak. Woo, but on that Pentecost day when the Holy Spirit came, the Bible just infused Peter with courage and strength and dynamic speaking. It is there that he said something to prove my point. That this was a plan of God. Would you turn with me to Acts chapter 2 verse 22. The book of Acts chapter 2 verse 22. I won't bother you with the whole message. I only want to focus in verse 22 to 24. There I want you to see. If you've never, never realized. The scheme and the plan and the plot. Of God's plan. Verse 22 of chapter 2 of the book of Acts. The risen Lord has risen from the dead. He appeared for 40 days. After 40 days, according to Luke 24 and Acts chapter 1, the Lord Jesus met him in the Mount of Olives and there he ascended into heaven. He's gone. He says, Wait in Jerusalem. Wait for the power from on high, the promise of my Father. Ten days later on, they were there in the day of Pentecost, an agriculture feast for the Jews. And there a mighty rushing wind came in the upper room. And 120 Christians, including the mother of Jesus, Mary, there in chapter 1, chapter 2, verse 14. You find her for the last time. She was there among the recipients of the grace of God. And the Holy Spirit came. And Peter now, he's bold. Peter now is emboldened. Peter is now Peter. And Peter begins to give the message. So powerful. Notice what he says in verse 22. Keep an eye on what he says. Watch this. Men of Israel. May I use that voice? Let me be loud, okay? Because he wasn't talking like this. Men of Israel. <laughs> Hear these words tonight. Like that. He was speaking to thousands of people. He had no PA system. Meaning he had to be loud. He's in the temple. Forgive me if I'm too loud. But you must hear this very loud. Amen. Men of Israel. Hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth. A man attested by God to you. By miracles and wonders and signs which God did through him. In your midst as you yourselves also know. Him being delivered. That's the crucifixion. Being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. You have taken him by lawless hands. Have crucified and put him to death. Whom God raised up. That's the resurrection. Having loosed the pains of death. Why Peter? Because it was not possible that he should be held by death. That's an amen. What's happening with this section, man? You got some chocolate, man. I don't know. Well, maybe it was in front of you, man. That's just... Come on, man. Wow. Did you catch that? Verse 23 says, He was delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God this is intentional this proves that Jesus was delivered by the deliberate purpose of God that it was according to celestial decree 
It was a plan. You see, Isaiah 53 verse 4 says this, It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. Surely he has borne our griefs and carry our sorrows, yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted by God. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are all healed. All oh, we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. There you see that God had foreknowledge. It was intentional. The prophets spoke about this. All the prophets. You see the Old Testament or the Hebrew scriptures is divided into three sections. We have 17 books, they're called historical, from the book of Genesis all the way to the book of Esther. That's the historical part. Then we have the next section, it's called poetical. We're talking about Job, we're talking about Psalms and Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Songs of Solomon. That's five. So you have 17 historical, five poetical, and then you have 17 prophetical. 17 books prophetical. All those 17 books prophetical, they all point one way. They all end like this. One day, prophet number one, prophet number two, prophet number three. One way, one day, one day. And then the last prophet of the Old Testament, but mentioned in the New Testament, his name is John the Baptist. Unlike the other prophets, he was about to say one day when he said, whoa, not one day today. There he is, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He got to proclaim him. He is the one. You see, Moses gave a hint to Nicodemus. He said to, to Nicodemus there in John chapter 3, 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have a eternal life. Now if you are a non-Jewish person, if you are a non-religious person, even though you watch the Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston, you still won't get this. A Jew will understand this. Because a Jew, a religious Jew, understood Moses and they revere Moses as a very high ideal man of God. And when Jesus said to Nicodemus, a religious man, he should have connected the dots. What dots? Well, when you read Numbers chapter 21, there's an episode that happened that God's punishment came upon the children of Israel in the wilderness for their disobedience. And we are told that serpents begin to bite people and there were deadly serpents. Lethal. One, they bite you, you will die within a matter of minutes. And they were being bitten. They were dying. And Moses, a type of Jesus, a mediator, he says, my God, my God, please. Okay, we got it. We got it. A type of mediator. And God told him, get a bronze serpent. Put it on a pole. Which is a symbol of the medical profession now. You've seen it. He took a bronze pole. God told Moses, just lift it up. Put it up. And tell the people, the ones that are dying, all they have to do is, thank you, all they have to do is, look up. Not a ritual, not a prayer, not a ceremony. You're dying, all you have to do, look up. And you will be healed instantly. What was Jesus saying? It's just as Moses lifted up the serpent, so will the Son of Man be lifted up upon the cross. That whoever looks upon Him... See, i got to remind you, if you're familiar with church services, we say, would you like to receive Jesus? And we say, yes. And then we lead someone in a sinner's prayer, right? Father, forgive me. That kind of a prayer. But nowhere is that prayer found. It was, it was made up in the 1700s. But we saw last Friday, we read in the Gospel of Luke, that one of the robbers, one of the 187 PCs who was next to Jesus, all he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me in your kingdom. Not I'm sorry, I repent. 
I confess. Please forgive me. Nothing. He just said, Lord, remember me. Paul the Apostle puts it much more simpler. He who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus rose from the dead, you shall be saved. If you believe, that's all it is. See, right now, if you're not a believer, it's between you and the Lord right now. Just between you and the Lord. And you're going to experience God immediately if you're sincere with your heart. Amen. Immediately. If you're not a Christian right now, I'm not going to ask you to come forward. I'm not going to ask you to, to shake a leg. I'm not asking you to step to come up here. Nothing like that. Just where you're at without closing your eyes. You're not a Christian, but you want to accept Jesus Christ. All you got to do is say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. That's it. On what basis? On the basis of His grace, yes. of His love, yes. His power. Yes. Oh, I, I have to cut my hair, I have to brush my teeth. No, you don't. <laughs> I have to come to a church every single day. No, you don't. Try where you're at. Right where you're at, you can speak to God and say, God, forgive me. Cleanse me. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Fill me with your Holy Spirit now. In Jesus' name, my world's a mess. My life is a mess. Jesus, if you're real, come into my heart. If you said that prayer right now, according to God's word, you are saved. Amen. And welcome to the family. Amen. Welcome to the family. Amen. Let me take you real quick like to, the, to how the... The orchestration begins. Let me take you to, to the birth of Jesus, the Messiah. First of all, the virgin birth recorded in Matthew chapter 22. The Bible says, So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord to the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. All that was done. To fulfill scripture. That's the book of Isaiah. Matthew chapter 215. When Jesus and Joseph and his mother became refugees. And they had to leave to Egypt. The Bible says. And, and was there until the death of Herod. That it might be fulfilled. Which was spoken by the Lord to the prophet saying. Out of Egypt I call my son. Herod in the slaughter of the innocent. There in Matthew 2.17, the Bible says, Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation, weeping, and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted, because they are no more. There you see the birth of Christ, orchestration. There you see the birth of Christ, there's a plan of God. And then when Jesus gets older, we are told in Matthew 2, 23, we call him Jesus of Nazareth. Why? The Bible says that he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled, which was called Jesus of Nazareth. Then we come to his baptism in Matthew 3, 15. Jesus wanted to get baptized and John says, I can't baptize you. John knew why. Because John was baptizing people with sin. And Jesus had none. He's a master. He's a Lord. He's a, he's a Messiah. But Jesus said, John, let us fulfill scripture and baptize me. And then we see in Matthew 4, 13. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. Why? That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying... The land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, by way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. And then you have now his ministry inauguration. Luke 3.23, we are told that Jesus began his ministry at the age of 30 years old. One of the first things he did, he went back to Galilee. He went into a synagogue according to Luke chapter 4, verse 14. And I'll give you the scripture that he was reading, Isaiah chapter 61. So Jesus went to his boyhood synagogue or his church of his youth. 
And he went. Everybody recognized who he was. And he did the unthinkable. He's, he's not a rabbi. He's just a, a carpenter's son. And he walks into the synagogue. And he goes to the place where it's restricted only for functions of the, of the temple. And he went behind. And he took one of the scrolls. And he began to read it. And he said this. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And the news of Jesus went out through all the surrounding region. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by everyone. So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath. He stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Quote, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then He closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on Him. And then He began to say, listen to what He said, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. That's mind blowing, man. You see, the Jewish people in the temple, they will read that one day the Messiah will come. One day the Messiah will come. Even on Passover, that's what they will do. Our Jewish friends today in the Passover, they will have reading that one day their Messiah will come. They're still saying, one day the Messiah will come. And here comes Jesus at 30 years old. He opens the scroll of Isaiah, and that's Isaiah 61. And what he reads is the inauguration of his ministry. And then he tells the people, today this scripture was fulfilled in your hearing. Amen? Amen. Wow. And then the ministry of Jesus. We know the ministry of Jesus was preaching, teaching, and healing. There were more, but that's the main that's the main fork. That's the, the trifork of his ministry. Preaching, teaching, and healing. Preaching means hear ye, hear ye, hear you. You don't know, you not know. Teaching is explaining. Preaching is proclaiming. Teaching is explaining. And then the healing will come. Jesus would heal left and right. John says at the end of the gospel, there's not enough room to record all the deeds. Peter told us there in chapter 2, a good man who went about doing good. He was a good man, but he was more than a good man. We are told about his ministry. There in Matthew 8, 14. He says, when Jesus had come into Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother lying sick with a fever. So he touched her and the fever left her. And she arose and served them. When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed. And he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all that were sick. Why? That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, He himself took our infirmities and bore our sickness. Again, fulfillment. God has a plan. And then Israel's rejection. In the book of Exodus, forgive me, in the book of Genesis, we have some malicious brothers selling the little brother Joseph to foreigners. That's the first time that the children of Jacob sold their nation to foreigners. This time Israel gives away his nation for a second time. They sell and they reject Jesus Christ. Matthew 5, 17 says, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. Jesus said, I did not come to destroy but to fulfill the law. For I surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle by no means pass from the law till it all fulfill. The unbelief of the nation, John chapter 12, 38, that the word of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled which he spoke, Lord, who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of the Lord has been revealed? That's pointing us to Isaiah 53. In John 15, there Jesus explains why the world hates him. He said, the world hates me 
And because they hate me, they'll hate you. The world is contradicted to who I am and what I am and what I represent. Even today, John says, there are many antichrists in this world. And we have them all over. Every institution has the antichrist now everywhere. Every institution. Think of any influential institution in the United States of America. And most of them, if not all of them, are antichrist. Except for one institution. One institution. Very influential institution. Who is that institution? You are. We are. The world has not touched us. The world tells us, dictate to us. They want us to make us into a marionette. They want to make us into a puppet. They want to give us false information, fake news, false news, misinformation, propaganda, telling you all this stuff. But the Word of God keeps you straight up. Amen. And we're different people. We are people. We are sheep of His hand. We, he, we, hear our, he, we hear His voice. We are attentive to His cadence. We understand the drum beat. We understand that we march to the tune of a different drummer. And he says, the, he says the tone because he is the master orchestrator. He is the conductor. And he's conducting our life. He's conducting the church. He's in charge of everything. He is sovereign. He's omniscient. He's omnipotent. Oh, I wish I can describe him to you. But he's everything. 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 And if my wife is watching right now, honey, this too shall pass, my love. This too shall pass. You know what I'm saying. May the Lord bless you, Papa. Matthew 13. In Matthew 13, Jesus was speaking in parables. And the disciples said, why do you speak to people in parables? But when you speak to us, you, you speak plain language. Why do you speak to the people in parables? Jesus said, and in the prophecy of Isaiah may be fulfilled, which says, hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. Matthew 13, 14. There in Matthew 13, 33, Jesus said, All these things spoke to the multitudes in parable. And without a parable, he did not speak to them, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables, and I will utter things kept secret from the foundation of the world. Now we come now to right before Passion Week. We call this the Lord's Prayer in John chapter 17. There in John chapter 17 verse 12, Jesus speaking. He's speaking to God. He said, quote, While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept. And none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you and I speak these things in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Yes. Now we got Palm Sunday. That was last week. We, we know that he entered into Jerusalem for the last time. And the Bible says all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, a full of a donkey. On Palm Sunday orchestration God had a plan so now Jesus tells them and he goes let's go to the garden he goes and prays there in the garden the arrest happens and all this takes real fast now but everything's orchestrated and the arrest in the garden of Gethsemane there you see Jesus betrayal in action but Jesus predicted that he said in Matthew 17, the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. Ah. Matthew 20, 18, behold, we are going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn them to death. Ah. In Mark chapter 13, verse 18, in the Last Supper, Jesus said, I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Whoa. Again, that's a, a reference to a good friend of King David. King David had a good friend by the name of Ahithophel. Ahithophel was his right man, a hand. He was the administrator. He was a friend of King David, a loyal friend. And he backstabbed him horribly. Backstabbed by a friend. Horrible Ahithophel. Look up Ahithophel and you'll see betrayer, rancor, <laughs> horrible, despicable. 
And then David wrote a psalm against him. So Jesus was making a reference that just like Ahithophel backstabbed David, Jesus was already predicting Judas Iscariot will backstab me. This was all known. And so we are told in Mark chapter 14, 49, when he was arrested, he told the people that arrested him, I was with you daily in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me then, but that the scripture must be fulfilled. In John 18, verse 9, it says, If you seek me, let this go their way, that the same might be fulfilled which he spoke of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. God had a plan. Judas. Judas regret, inconsolable grief, and worldly sorrow produced him to go crazy. In Matthew 27, verse 9 says, Then was fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the value of him who was priced, whom they of the children of Israel priced. You see the word fulfillment? This was fulfilled according to the scriptures. This was fulfilled. God orchestrated the whole plan. And now we come to the crucifixion. The crucifixion was part of God's plan. John 18, 32. That the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying by what death he would die. They crucified him and divided his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, what was spoken by the prophet there in Psalm 22. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Mark 15, 28, at the crucifixion. So the scripture was fulfilled which says he was numbered with the transgressors. Isaiah 53, verse 12. John 19, 28, after this, Jesus knowing that all things were accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. The presence of mine. Jesus hanging on the cross, looking at everything around. He was on a divine timetable. Knowing that everything was fulfilled. One of the seven arrays for the cross. He said, I thirst. Everything was fulfilled. In John chapter 19 verse 36. The legs were to be broken of the victims because it was a holy day. And the Bible says, for these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. Lastly, in John 19, 23, then the soldiers, when they crucified Jesus, they took his garments and made four parts to each soldier, a part and also a tunic. Now the tunic was without seam, woven from one top in one, in one piece. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not tear it, but let us cast lots, who shall shall be. And they said this so that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore, the soldiers did these things. The resurrection. I call this the why, why narrative. We we'll close with this. Go with me to Luke chapter 24. And we close. Luke chapter 24. Would you believe 2350? Well, no, they picked them up already. Chapter 24. We ended in verse 12. Forgive me. Verse 13 of chapter 24 of the book of Luke. Let me, let me set the setting now. This is the day of the resurrection. Jesus already appeared to several people. Appeared to the women. Appeared to several people already. The word is out that he's alive. But two men, two disciples of Jesus have not seen him. They're walking away. They're going back home. They're dejected. They're delusioned. They're depressed. They're bummed out because the, the last thing they saw was Friday. They don't know about Sunday. And they're walking home, probably kicking the dust. And they're going home. It was just, we thought it would be him. And watch how humorous, how comedic this is. This is, the, this is if people say God does not have any humor, I, I take him to the scripture. Because Jesus walks next to these unbelievers. They're believers, but they're unbelieving state. And Jesus walks up to them. They can't recognize him. And Jesus said, hey, what's happening? Oh, man, you know. Why are you bumped out, eh? He said, what? Are you the only stranger? Don't you know what happened in Jerusalem? And Jesus said, what? You don't get it? What? Why would you do that? What? What things happen, eh? 
is, is there. I'm not making you looking at me like I'm making it up. Chapter, thir- chapter 24, verse 13. Now behold, two of them were traveling the same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together all these things which had happened. So it was what they, they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Verse 16. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And he said to them, uh, what kind of conversation is this that you've been having with one another as you walk in our sad? Then one of them, Chewy, answered and said, no, <laughs> Chewy, sorry. <laughs> Chewy. Verse 17. Then one of whose name was Cleopas answered and said to Jesus, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? Have you not known the things that happened there in these past days? And Jesus said to them, what things? So they said to him, the thing concerning Jesus of Nazareth, past tense, who was a prophet, mighty indeed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers deliver him to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. Verse 21, I can hear their voices whining down. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and some certain women, you know women, certain women of our company who arrive at the tomb early, they astonish us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and sure enough found it just as the woman had said. But him they did not see. Now notice the sternness of the living Jesus on the Sunday morning resurrection. Then Jesus said to these two, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophet has spoken. Notice what verse 26, God has a plan. Ought not the Messiah to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. God had a plan. Verse 28. And they drew near to the village where they were going and indicated that he would have gone further. But they constrained him saying, abide with us for it is towards evening and the day is far spent. So he went in to stay with him. Now it came to pass as he sat at the table with him that he took bread, blessed it, and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were open and they knew him and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, trip out. (laughs) Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scripture to us? So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with him gathered together saying, The Lord is risen indeed and he has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. In the meantime, as these men were talking, verse 36, now as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Shalom, peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened. They supposed they had been a spirit. And he said to them, here's why I call it the why, why narrative. Why are you trouble? Why do you doubt arises in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that is, it is I myself. Handle me and see, for the spirit does not have flesh and bone as you have seen. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they were still did not believe for the joy and marveling, he said to them, Have you any food? Yes, they haven't eaten for three days, man. Have you any food? And they gave him fish and chips. So they gave him a piece of a broiled fish and some honeycomb. And he took it and ate in their presence. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you. Notice the plan of God. That all things must be what? fulfilled which were written in what in the law of Moses in the prophets in the Psalms concerning me that's historical that's poetical and that's prophetical verse 45 and he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures that is my prayer this morning that God will open your understanding to comprehend the scriptures 
And the way to comprehend the scriptures is by being born again. When the spirit of truth comes upon you, when you receive Jesus Christ, you're able now to be independent. You belong to God. You are sheep of his fold. You hear his voice. You understand the word of God. You have been born again. You have been enlightened. You've been transferred from darkness to light, from a light to the truth. And now you're walking in truth. We become children of truth. And there's nothing we can do against the truth. For truth is truth. And God is truth. And he is the way, the truth, and the life. And you don't want to live on the truth. And then you're going to continue to meander without a plan. But God has a plan. And then he says this, verse 47, 42, 48. Would you believe 46? <laughs> then he said to them that it is written and that it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission or forgiveness of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem and Montebello, and you are witness of these things. Behold, I send you the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry or wait in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Ladies and gentlemen, God had a plan. God still has a plan. Now, yes, perhaps you did not receive the Lord. I would, look, I would like to close this segment with the worship team. We sing a song, but before we do, before you stand to your feet, perhaps you said that prayer today, earlier, and you realize, my, something changed in here. Something happened within me, and it's happening. Or perhaps you did not say it. Here's an opportunity for you. An opportunity that on Easter sunrise service, on Easter Sunday morning, you committed your life to Jesus Christ. You want to have His plan. His plan is good. He has a plan for your life. Not plan B, not an alternative plan. He has the real plan. He wants to guide you and lead you. If you would like to dedicate your life to Jesus, you like to accept Jesus Christ, you want to be reconciled to God, you don't have to do anything but just surrender to Him. I would like to do that publicly now. Before we close, whoever you are, or whether you're watching on the internet, it's for you. But if you're here and you would like to pray, and I would like to pray for you, with you, to receive Jesus, to forgive you, to restore you, to welcome you back. If that is you, would you please stand to your feet? Let me pray for you to receive the Lord, whomever you may be, quickly. Absolutely. Don't be ashamed. God has a plan for your life. Anybody else? Just stand. Quickly. Anybody else? quickly wonderful for those of you that are standing thank you for those of you that are standing God has a plan for you God has a plan for you don't freak out would you repeat the simple prayer after me in your heart dear Jesus I'm sorry forgive me I'm a sinner I repent of all my sin I believe that you rose from the dead and I ask you to come into my life as my Lord and my Savior, as my Redeemer and my friend. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you. Let's all stand. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you. And you have a wonderful, wonderful time. And stay away from me. Nah, I'm just kidding. Love you guys. <laughs>
Yeah. 